1927, an American journalist wrote, a change has come over our democracy. It is called consumptionism. The American citizen's first importance to his country is now no longer that of citizen, but that of consumer. The growing wave of consumerism helped in turn to create a stock market boom. And yet again, Edward Bernays became involved, promoting the novel idea that ordinary people should buy shares, borrowing money from banks he also represented. And yet again, millions followed his advice. He was uniquely knowledgeable about how people in large numbers are going to react to products and ideas and so on. But in, term, in political terms, if he were to go out, so I can't imagine that he could get three people to stand and listen. Wasn't particularly articulate, was a kind of funny looking, and didn't have any sense of reaching out for people one on one. None at all. He didn't talk about, didn't think about people in groups of one, thought about people in groups of thousands. So I would have nothing to do with it. Hello? Bernays soon became famous as the man who understood the mind of the crowd. And in 1924, the president contacted him. President Coolidge was a quiet, taciturn man and had become a national joke. The press portrayed him as a dull, humorless figure. Bernays' solution was to do exactly the same as he had done with products. He persuaded 34 famous film stars to visit the White House. And for the first time, politics became involved with public relations. And I lined up these 34 people and I'd say, what's your name? He'd say, Al Jolson. I'd say, Mr. President, Al Jolson. Next day, every newspaper in the United States had a front page story, President Coolidge, entertains actors at White House. And the Times had a headline which said, President nearly laughed. And everybody was happy. But while Bernays became rich and powerful in America, in Vienna, his uncle was facing disaster. Like much of Europe, Vienna was suffering an economic crisis and massive inflation, which wiped out all of Freud's savings. Facing bankruptcy, he wrote to his nephew for help. Bernays responded by arranging for Freud's works to be published for the first time in America, and began to send his uncle precious dollars, which Freud kept secretly in a foreign bank account. He was Freud's agent, if you will, to get his books published. Well, of course, once the books were being published, Eddie couldn't help himself but to promote these books, see that everybody read them, make them controversial, emphasize the fact that, do you know what Freud says about sex and what he says cigarettes are a symbol of and so on and so forth? How do you suppose all those stories got out? Certainly the academics weren't spreading these around the country. Eddie Bernays was. Then, when Freud became accepted, well, then, of course, to go to, to a client and say, well, Uncle Siggy, see, then that had some cachet. But notice there, first Eddie created Uncle Siggy in the U.S., made him acceptable, secondly, and thirdly, then capitalized on Uncle Siggy. Typical Bernays performance. Bernays also suggested that Freud promote himself in the United States. He proposed his uncle write an article for Cosmopolitan, a magazine that Bernays represented, entitled A Woman's Mental Place in the Home. Freud was furious. Such an idea, he said, was unthinkable. It was vulgar, and anyway, he hated America. Freud was now becoming increasingly pessimistic about human beings. In the mid-twenties, he retreated in the summers to the Alps, sometimes staying in an old hotel, the Pension Moritz in Berchtesgaden. It is now a ruin. Freud began to write about group behavior, about how easily the unconscious aggressive forces in human beings could be triggered when they were in crowds. Freud believed he had underestimated the aggressive instincts in human beings. They were far more dangerous 
than he had originally thought. After World War I, Freud uh, was uh, basically a pessimist. He felt that man is an impossible creature, uh, a very, very sadistic and, uh, and uh, uh, bad uh, uh, species and uh, did not believe that man can be improved. Man is a ferocious animal, the most ferocious uh, animal that exists. They enjoy torturing and, uh, and killing and he didn't like man. The publication of Freud's works in America had an extraordinary effect on journalists and intellectuals in the 1920s. What fascinated and frightened them was the picture Freud painted of submerged, dangerous forces lurking just under the surface of modern society. Forces that could erupt easily to produce the frenzied mob which had the power to destroy even governments. It was this they believed had happened in Russia. To many, this meant that one of the guiding principles of mass democracy was wrong. The belief that human beings could be trusted to make decisions on a rational basis. The leading political writer, Walter Lippmann, argued that if human beings were in reality driven by unconscious, irrational forces, then it was necessary to rethink democracy. What was needed was a new elite who could manage what he called the bewildered herd. This would be done through psychological techniques that would control the unconscious feelings of the masses. And so here you have Walter Lippmann, probably the most influential political thinker in the United States, who is essentially saying that the basic mechanism of the mass mind is unreason, is irrationality, is animality. He believes that the mob in the street, which is how he sees ordinary people, are people who are driven not by their minds but by their spinal cords. The notion of kind of animal drives unconscious instinctual drives lurking beneath the surface of civilization and so they started looking towards psychological science as a way of understanding the mechanisms by which the popular mind works specifically with the goal of figuring out how to understand how to apply those mechanisms to strategies for uh, social control Edward Bernays was fascinated by Lippmann's arguments and also saw a way to promote himself by using them. In the 1920s, he began to write a series of books which argued that he had developed the very techniques Lippmann was calling for. By stimulating people's inner desires and then sating them with consumer products, he was creating a new way to manage the irrational force of the masses. He called it the engineering of consent. Democracy, to my father, was a wonderful concept, but I don't think he felt that all those publics out there would m have reliable judgment, uh, and that they, that they could that they very easily might vote for the wrong man or want the wrong thing, so that they had to be guided from above. Uh, it's enlightened despotism in a sense. You appeal to their desires and their unrecognized longings, that sort of thing. That you can tap into their deepest desires or their deepest fears and use that to your own purposes. And then, in 1928, a president came to power who agreed with Bernays. President Hoover was the first politician to articulate the idea that consumerism had become the central motor of American life. After his election, he told a group of advertisers and public relations men, you have taken over the job of creating desire and have transformed people into constantly moving happiness machines. Machines which have become the key to economic progress. What was beginning to emerge in the 1920s was a new idea of how to run mass democracy. At its heart was the consuming self, which not only made the economy work, but was happy and docile, and so created a stable society. 